the day of the Lord presentation, this is the timeline, the timeline of the day of the Lord, the timeline of the day of the Lord. So let's begin with it right now. Here we go. There's three things we have to understand. There's three parts of this, and each piece is very important. If we're going to understand the day of the Lord, we have to understand the creation timeline. The creation timeline. You know, in six days, God created everything, and on the seventh day, he rested. We're going to look at that briefly. We have to understand the history of mankind also. That's how long has the history of mankind been going on. We have to understand that. And we have to understand what a day is to God. What is a day to God? What is a day to God? So all these different things are going to help us understand. Okay, so here we go. To understand the day of the Lord, we must understand the creation timeline and the history of man and how they correlate and resemble one another. Okay, what is a day to God? Second Peter 3, 8, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Does anybody think this is metaphorical? Is this literal or metaphorical? Anybody listening out there? Is this literal or is this metaphorical? That a day, one day with God is as a thousand years. Is that, is that literal or metaphorical? Got literal out there, seven, literal, yeah, yeah, it is literal, it is literal. This right here is literally 1,000 years of mankind's life experience, 1,000 years is as one day to God. That means God measures a day, a day to God is measured in relation to 1,000 years of mankind. That's a fact. It is written. It is a reality. And if we build upon this scripture, we're going to understand a whole lot more about the day of the Lord. Okay, let's continue. In Genesis, we can see that when God was creating, there's the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, and on and on. We can see that there was an evening and a morning. How many of you see that evening and morning? There was an evening and a morning to God's day, wasn't there? Now, I'm saying this is God's day. I'm saying this is God's day, not man's day. So there's an evening and a morning, an evening and a morning to the second day. There was an evening and a morning to the third day. There was an evening and a morning to the fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, and so on. But you might think, well, that's a 24-hour day. Well, the sun wasn't created. What day was the sun created? Anybody know? The sun was created. That's a good guess, Marshall, but that's not right. You know why? Because it was the day. And this is what's interesting, Marshall. And I'm glad you brought that up. He's saying that on the first day, light and darkness was created. And that makes us think that day and light and dark, day and night, but that's not the time yet. See, there's a difference between the realities of light and dark, day and night, and time. So time, the time element for mankind wasn't created until the fourth day. On the fourth day, he created the sun for what purpose? Look what it says in Genesis. Let there be lights in the firmament. This is on the fourth day. Look down here. On the fourth day, God created, look, God made two great lights right? One was the sun and one was the moon, and he also made the stars. So the sun, the moon, and the stars were created and put in the firmament, which was made on the second day, I think. So our sun and our moon and our stars was not created until the fourth day, but yet God is saying morning and evening right here. God is saying morning and evening on the first day. What morning and evening is he referring to? Is everybody with me? Do you guys understand where I'm going with this? The morning and the evening were the first day. Well, what morning and what evening? Does God have a morning and an evening that's different than our 24-hour morning and evening? Apparently, that the morning and the evening that made up each one of these days has nothing to do, are you with me, with our sun and our moon and our day, our 24-hour days. We just saw... That a day, one day with God, one day with God is as a thousand years. One day with God is a thousand years. So when we see the morning and the evening here, 
When we see the morning and the evening right here, that has nothing to do with our 24-hour sun because look what it says. Look what it says. He made them for what? He made them for seasons and for days and for years. That's time. Let's, uh, let me highlight that. Look what it says. Let there be lights in the firmament. They'll divide the day and night, which was created on the first day. So the day and night have nothing to do with morning and evening. Can you understand what I'm saying? When God created the day and the night, those are elements of reality that he created have nothing to do with morning and evening until he created the sun, the moon, and the stars. And then they separated the night and the day. Amen? You understand that? So when God was creating our time structure, our calendar structure, our counting mechanism of time, he uses the sun, moon, and stars to do that. And the morning and evenings for each day of creation are his morning and evening which is a thousand year day measurements, thousand year day measurements, morning and evening, a thousand year day measurement, morning and evening to God. And then on the fourth day, he creates the sun, moon, and stars. And they are what? To divide the night and the day. And look at this. They'll be for signs. They'll be for seasons. They'll be for look days and years. Now you're talking about 24 hour days. 24 hour day was not created until the fourth day of creation. Give me an amen if you understand that. Give me an amen if you understand that our 24 hour day period, this right here, this 24 hour day period right here was not created until the fourth day. God's morning and evening is different than this 24 hour day period that he created specifically on the fourth day of creation with the sun that was being created and it was created for, one of the purposes is for this day period right here, where it'll be dividing the night and the day. And that's when that's, that part of it happened on the fourth day. It has nothing to do with the 24-hour period in creation. Now we get a 24-hour day when he creates the sun. Now we get years. Now we know what a thousand is. A thousand years comes into play here. Now we're getting the understanding of what a thousand years is and what a 24-hour day is by the creation of the sun, moon, and stars on the fourth day of God's thousand-year day. So each day is a thousand years. Each day of creation has a morning and an evening. And then on the fourth day, he creates the sun for the purpose of dividing the light and the dark and to give us a calendar, seasons, 24-hour day, and a 360-day year, 360-day year, right? And on the end of that thousand years, that was the fourth day on the end of God's 1,000 year morning and evening day. That was called the fourth day. Now, we have to get this really understood before we continue in with the history of mankind and then inevitably the day of the Lord. It's very important that we lay this foundation and understand this. Very important. Okay, so one day with the Lord is of the 1,000 years. Let's continue. Here's the days of creation, the creation timeline. So let's look at this. Let's look at this. Day one, one day with the Lord is a thousand years. So day one is a thousand years. Day two is a thousand is, is another thousand. That's two thousand years, and so on and so forth. Day three and day four, you get up to four thousand years. Day five is five thousand years. Day six, when he created man, at the end of day six, by the time man was created, that was at six thousand years. Six thousand years, man was finally created. And on the seventh day, which is another thousand years, the seventh day was the 7,000 years of completion, totally completing the creation process. All right. So that's what we got. That's how long creation took, including the seventh day of rest. That's the Sabbath rest, we call it. God called it the Sabbath day. And it was a thousand years of rest. It's also when the fall of man happened. Now, this is speculative, and I'm not sure if anybody really knows. Did the fall of man happen during the, the Sabbath rest? Or did God let a thousand years go by before he allowed man to fall? I, I think it was at the end, personally. I personally think it was at the end. You can have your own opinion, and everybody should, but it is speculative. And I think it was at the end because of what we're going to see about the day of the Lord coming up in the future. It looks more believable that it was at the end of that thousand year period. And everything's going to make sense to that idea when we study closer what the day of the Lord is. So we'll put that on hold for now when the fall of man came. But that's what we're looking at at the moment. So let's continue here. 
Now, we've looked at the days of creation, all six days and plus the seventh day rest in the Bible, the book of Genesis. We looked at what a day to God is, and we saw when 24 hours come, came into play and the, the years for mankind, which is a different timeline, on day four when the sun, moon, and stars was created, which started the calendar clock of the history of man. So the history of man, when did it begin? A lot of people say when Adam was created, and you've got a lot of people calculating 4004 BC, and who knows if they're right or if they're wrong. I'm not here to, to debate that accuracy or pinpoint precision there. So, but we are going to look at something called the beginning. When did it begin? And we're going to just use with that, we're going to use Adam and Eve to help us understand the beginning of that. The history of man. Now that we've studied the creation timeline, let's examine the history of man. Then we can learn about the day of the Lord after we build these two building blocks. So with the first building blocks been laid, the creation timeline. Now the second one is the history of man. We have to build this properly and understand this correctly. And then we can get into eschatology, the study of the future, the study of the end times and take a look at the day of the Lord. So this is the next building block. Here we go. All right. So we're going to start with Adam and Eve, whether it was at the beginning or the end of the Sabbath rest. We don't know, but that's where we're going to begin because that's when the fall took place. We're going to begin with the fall of mankind. How long were they living in the garden without falling? Maybe the whole thousand year millennial kingdom. Can I get an amen if that's a reasonable thought? It's a reasonable thought. For a thousand years, they lived in the garden of Eden with no problem. And at the end of that thousand years, what happened? Satan was loosed. <laughs> what, what does that sound? Does that sound familiar to anybody? Is that, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like uh, something that happens again in the end times. And this is why I'm more uh, inclined to believe that Adam and Eve was in the garden for a thousand years without any trouble. Anyway, let's continue here. So we're going to begin at that time, Adam and Eve, when they fell all the way into Christ's return on the last day, on the seventh day of human history. And we're going to look at how long that day, don't forget how long a day is to God. And we're going to discuss when exactly is that Christ's return? Is it at the beginning? Is it at the rapture? Is, is it at the end of the millennium? Is it at the beginning of the millennium? We don't know. We're going to figure that out. But the history of mankind will start at the fall of Adam and Eve and all the way until Christ comes back. All right, so let's, let's look at this. Take a look at this concept. This is a very important principle. This is going to tie in the creation theory into the human, uh, mankind's history. And it says, because the creation days were 6,000 years, this is a principle that's going to help us understand the day of the Lord and eschatology a lot better. It's a principle that because the creation days or 6,000 years plus a seventh day of rest, that human history, the, that history of man follows the same pattern. The history of man would follow the same pattern. That 6,000 years of history will go by plus 1,000 years of rest, just like what happened in the Garden of Eden. And this is a principle that we believe applies so let's take a look at uh, the history of man here. We've got the six days of creation, which is from Adam to current times, right to this very moment, give or take a few years. The calendars are a little choppy. And we have 6,000 years of history that's gone by already. 6,000 years. And what we have here is one day that has not happened yet, and that's the last day. And that day is also a thousand years. I hope you guys can see that. The last, it's, it's called the last day. And it's also for a thousand years. It's also going to be for a thousand years. Okay. It's called the day of the Lord also. The last day. And it's called the day of the Lord. Now this day, this last day is the day of the Lord. And that's what we're going to really dig into here coming up in just a moment when I get done with this part. Okay, so the, seven, the seventh day is the day of the Lord. 
And it's also called the last day. And there's other names we'll get to. It's got different names for it. Okay, you guys with me? You guys with me out there? So let's examine. The first four days, pay attention. You're not going to want to miss this. This is getting more detailed and more complicated. So listen up. The first four days is before Christ. All right? The first four days is before Christ. That's 4,000 years. Since the fall of Adam and Eve to the time Christ had died on the cross was 4,000 years. Four days. Okay? Now there's two dispensations during that time period. I don't know if you can read that or see that. I hope that you can. Let me see if I can get a little closer for you. Now, these are not exact. I'm not saying at the end of the second day was the end of the dispensation of conscience. And a dispensation is nothing more than the way God deals with mankind's sin. The way God deals with man's sin is called a dispensation. There are different dispensations because God has dealt with man's sin differently. Before the law was given, here's the, here's the next dispensation. Now, this dispensation may be uh, only a day and a half. I think it was like 1400 BC that uh, Moses got the Ten Commandments. That's fine. I'm not trying to be exact here. I'm giving you concepts and theories and understanding on this. And it's not exactly day by day precise here. And that's okay. It doesn't have to be. These can all still be true, and it doesn't have to be 100% hair-splitting accurate as to when these dispensations here uh, match with the four days. See what I'm saying? It does, that's irrelevant. It really is. Don't get too confused about that. There were two dispensations in the before Christ four days, 4,000 years. When the law came with Moses, we entered into a dispensation of the law. That means God was dealing with man's sin through the law of Moses. And just the consciousness, the conscience, the conscience was still there, but God was not only using your conscience to handle and process man's sin, but he's using something that came strictly down from God and on the tablets of stone, the law of Moses, which made sin a little, a lot more uh, intense. Okay, so I hope you guys understand that. Let's, uh, let's move on here. Next slide. So that's 4,000 years. Christ came at the end of the fourth day. All right? Christ came at the end of the fourth day after 4,000 years had passed. And there was two days. Now we have the fifth and sixth day. These are called the last days, plural. The last days. These are two days or 2,000 years for a different dispensation called the dispensation of grace. Okay, let's take a look at that. These last two days are called the last days. And this is a different dispensation now, completely different way God's dealing with man's sin. He's not dealing with man's sin according to conscience or according to the law of Moses. Although conscience is very important to God in this dispensation of grace, it's not gone away, just like some of the elements that are in the law of Moses haven't completely vanished. They've been transcended into the dispensation of grace. In other words, you can't kill people still just because the law of Moses is not, you know, utilized the way it was. That still applies to the dispensation of grace. And a lot of people don't understand how God builds the dispensations on top of one another, although some things are obsolete. He's creating something new and more powerful. I, I don't, this is not about the dispensations right now. This is about learning about the day of the Lord. So let me not get too sidetracked on this dispensation topic. So these last two days are called the last days. It's 2,000 years and it's during the dispensation of grace. Let's continue to the next slide. Okay, so there's your dispensations. There's your time period. These are the before Christ and after Christ time divisions and history that we've gone through, even to the very minute that we now speak. We're at the end of the sixth day and the dispensation of grace, the last days. We're in the last days. Give me a seven if you understand. You're in the last days, baby. <laughs> You're in the last days. 
Okay, that's where you're at. If you know, you want to know where you're at in the history, mankind, you're in the last days. Okay, let's move on. Let's move on. Okay, so there's the last days. Let's read about this just a little bit. Hebrews chapter 1 says uh, in verse 2 that in these last days, last days, God has spoken to us by his son. He didn't speak to us through the son of God during the time of Moses or dur during the time of the conscience. But in these last days, plural, that's what he's talking about. The last 2,000 years, God has chosen to speak to mankind through the scriptures, which record the life of Jesus. The four Gospels in particular record the words of the Son of God spoken to the prophets and apostles and teachers, pastors, bishops, elders of the church, and passed down through all the churches throughout the last, what, last days, the last 2,000 years, Christ has been speaking to mankind. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in these last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. Now, these last days will apply to this last generation, but there's another term for the last generation, and it's called the latter time. And the latter time is different than the last days, and we're not going to get into that right now. They're both very similar because in the last days, you have a latter time in the last days, okay? They're, you can't separate them really, except to know that the last days is 2,000 years, and the latter times is really about the last generation, which is about 70 to 80 years. Let's continue. All right, so here's the history of mankind. We're looking at the last days, the last 2,000 years after Christ up to this current moment. And then you got the first 4,000 years or the first four days before Christ time periods. And so you have the last, the last day. Now we're going to get into something called the last day. There's a difference between the last days and the last day. Are you with me? We're going, to, we're going to read about that right now coming up. I'll say that again, just so you're not getting too confused. There is a difference between the last days and the last day. Amen. Are you with me? Okay. That's a thousand years long, just like every other day of God is a thousand years. We've established that. There's no reason to think that this seventh day is at any different time period literally a thousand years like any other day. That's why when we get to the book of Revelation, it talks about a thousand years. We know that that's literally 1,000 years and not some figurative metaphorical concept. All right, so it's a thousand years. And let's take a look at some of this about the last day. Jesus seems to be the only one that talks about the last day in the book of John. John, the book of John is very, very important to understanding the concept of the last day. And we need that. So here we got chapter 6 and chapter 11 of the book of John. I'm just going to briefly look at some of these verses here. Chapter 6, verse 39 and 40. Jesus speaking, he says, And this is the Father's will which sent me, that all which he has given me I'll lose nothing but should raise it up again on the last day. Look what's going to happen on the last day. Notice that he should raise it up again at the last day. At the last day. There's going to be a resurrection on the last day. We know there's two resurrections. When are they? They're both on the last day. How long is the last day? Thousand years. There's two resurrections that happen on the last day. We're not going to get into that either. That's another sidetrack. I can get sidetracked here and just, I don't want to get sidetracked. But the resurrections, both of them happen on the last day. And here's the interesting thing. They're separated by the beginning and the end of that day. So the, the righteous are raised at the beginning of the last day. The wicked are raised for the great white throne judgment at the end of the last day. Same day. Same day. That's why people need to understand this better. Now, what does he say here? I will raise them up on the last day. Verse 40, uh, John 6, 44. What does it say? No man can come to me except of the Father who draws him, and I will raise him up again on the last day. John 6, 54. 
Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And then Martha, speaking to Jesus in John eleven twenty four, 24, says, I know that Lazarus, he shall rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And that is all we know, according to these scriptures that are clearly written down about the last day. It's specifically referring to the resurrection. Okay, but we can build upon this knowledge. This is all you need to know to put all the pieces together that fit beautifully later. So this little piece of the puzzle is very important. Okay, it's very specific about the resurrection, but that's okay. Now let's continue over here. We have the last day, the last day right here. And it's also called the Sabbath rest. Let's take a look at some of these names. We'll get to, we're going to get to this in just a moment. The Sabbath rest, the day of Christ, judgment day, and the millennial kingdom. These are all different references to that last day. Okay. So it's a new dispensation. Okay. It's a new dispensation also. So that means the dispensation of grace that we learned about is going to no longer be implemented. So we have 6,000 years from the, the very first day until where we're at now. And then we have the 1,000 years on the last day that's coming up, also called the day of the Lord. It's the day of the Lord. It's the last day. And it's a new dispensation. It's not going to be the dispensation of conscience, the dispensation of the law of Moses, or the dispensation of grace. There's a trumpet coming, and it's going to end the dispensation of grace, where the blood of Jesus is cleansing people from their sins. That's what the dispensation of grace is mainly about, that you can be washed by the blood of the lamb sacrifice and be cleansed and given the Holy Spirit. That's a, two important pieces to the dispensation of grace that will not be in effect. As far as I can tell through scriptures and reading and studying, it's coming to an end. All right. And there'll be a brand new dispensation for the millennial kingdom time period. The last day, the day of the Lord, that thousand years, something else. And I don't even have a name for it. That's why I put new dispensation. Cause I guess you could say millennial kingdom dispensation or whatever you want to call it. It's going to be different than the dispensation of grace. All right, let's continue here. All right, the last day. Let's take a look at this. From the fall of Adam and Eve to the return of Christ, we have the first four days, 4,000 years, two dispensations, and then Christ comes at the end there. Then from, for the last 2,000 years since Christ came, we've got two days or 2,000 years. These are called the last days and the dispen dispensation of grace. That's 6,000 years from Adam to right at this very moment. Then we have the seventh day, another thousand years. And these are the different names for it. The last day or the day of the Lord. And these are, this is the time period we're going to do a Bible study about today. Now we're ready to get into our Bible study. Okay, we haven't even, we haven't really studied closely yet about this day. So this is the day we're going to be looking at right here, the seventh day. Here's the, the graph all together. All seven days, all 7,000 years. Here's the time period we're going to be looking at, the seventh day, right here. And we're going to study this right here in a Bible study coming up just now. All right? So that's where we're at with this whole thing. We're looking at this right here, and here's the different names for it. And here's some, some of the scriptures to prove this. This is not exhaustive. I just got one scripture for each name. It's called the last day. You could call it the Sabbath rest. Uh, it's called the day of the Lord more than anything. It's called judgment day quite a bit. It's called the day of Christ. And we can infer that it's definitely the millennial kingdom time period as well. So that's what we're going to be looking at today, guys. So I hope you're ready for part two of our Bible study. Give me a seven if you're ready for part two of our Bible study. All right, let's get back over here. Let's go to the next presentation here. The day of the Lord, the end of the age. Here we go. You guys ready? You're with me out there? Presentation, the day of the Lord and the end of the age. Okay, the objective here is to define and explain the day of the Lord and to explain the three stages, three stages of the day of the Lord. This is interesting about the day of the Lord that a lot of people are not aware of, all right? Because we get this scripture 
that as soon as the day of the Lord happens, everything's going to melt instantly, like immediately. Like that's that little second there is the day of the, the Lord. And that's part of the day of the Lord, but that's not the completeness of understanding the full measure of what the day of the Lord is. It's definitely part of it. There, there's going to be some mel elements melting, no doubt about it. But understanding the stages, three is all I can identify. There may be more. I hope the Lord shows us more and more about this over time. But so far, this is all I have understood about the day of the Lord is there's three stages. Okay, the day of the Lord, there's three stages. First, there's the initiation of the day of the Lord. When does it begin? There is a beginning point of the day of the Lord. There is a point where the dispensation of grace and all the mercy and all the time that people have collecting, God's collecting the body of Christ, preaching the gospel, the history of man, it's all going to come to an end at some point. And that seventh day is going to kick in. So there's an initiation moment. And personally, I believe it's at the seventh trumpet at the resurrection rapture event, that that's when it begins. Okay. And then we have the duration. How long is the whole day of the Lord? Is it just for 10 seconds when God melts the elements with fervent heat that we love to quote that scripture. And, and we, we think that that's, that's our little, that's our little concept of what the day of the Lord is. That one scripture or that, that idea that when the day of the Lord happens, it's going to burn everything and the, the mountain and, and the mountains are going to fall. The islands are going to disappear. The sky is going to fall back. The stars are going to fall down. Yes, that is going to happen. But that's all we know about the day of the Lord. And that's all we think about. And we think that that happens within 10 seconds and that, that's all there is to the day of the Lord. That's only a small slither of understanding. The duration of the day of the Lord includes that devastating, universe-changing, trembling, shaking of the elements and melting of the elements that happens during some time during the thousand years. And that doesn't take a thousand years to happen. This is what confuses people because you think the day of the Lord and you only think of in terms of melting the elements. And then you think, well, how can that go on for a thousand years? It doesn't go on for a thousand years because that's not all that the day of the Lord is. There's much, much more to the day of the Lord than just that melting of the elements. Okay, the duration. How long is it? I think it's a thousand years. I think it's the last day, which we've determined to be a thousand years. Then there's the completion. When does it come to an end? And I think that that's when the fire melting the elements actually takes place. At the end of the thousand years, there will be that fervent heat melting the elements and the mountains falling and all this stuff. And it may happen a couple of times. I don't know. But there is going to come a time when God burns away this world and the sky even. And the stars will fall. And all that stuff's going to happen. So again, there is the initiation of the day of the Lord, the duration of the day of the Lord, and the completion of the day of the Lord. What is the day of the Lord? Well, let's start by, I think we understood already, what does a day mean? And we've already looked at that. Okay, but in the scriptures, let's look it up, is to understand, one of the keys to understanding the rapture, the tribulation, judgment, and the wrath of God is to understand what the day of the Lord is all about and how it applies to the end of the age or the time of the end. Is the day of the Lord an instant moment of fire that melts all the elements in a split second? Or is the day of the Lord a thousand year period of Jesus on earth? Or is it both? Can it be possible that the day of the Lord is both? A thousand year period with Christ on the earth, ruling and reigning, and a time when the elements will melt with fervent heat. I say it's both. First, let's make sure we understand how the Hebrew word for day is used. Okay, the, the Hebrew word for day just means time. It can mean a day, 24 hour day. It can mean year, a specific point in time. It can denote a period of light in contrast to darkness. So the daytime, it could be day and a period of 24 hours or just a vague general time period, a year. All right. So it's clear the word day does not mean 24 hour period only. And this is just redundant here because these are two separate presentations. And because we went over the, the previous presentation, we've already established that a day to God is a thousand years. So this is a little bit repetitive here about 
you know, what day means. We've already established that it's a thousand years to God. And we've already seen in, in uh, creation day four, when the sun was created, that that's when the 24-hour day came into existence. So what is the day of the Lord? Let's see, the term day is used many times in the Old Testament. And it, it always seems to refer to, now let's, let's talk about the term, the day of the Lord. The term, the phrase, the term, day of the Lord, is used many times in the Bible. And it seems to always refer to the appointed time, the appointed time in which God reveals himself to the world and brings judgment for both the wicked and righteous. Okay, now I would say, let me change this a little bit. He brings judgment for both the wicked and righteous and he establishes a righteous kingdom. So the day of the Lord is most certainly about judgment. In fact, that's one of the, the names for this day. This last day, it's called judgment day. It's a thousand years long. It's the day where God separates the goats and the sheep. It's the day when that seventh trumpet blows that God has put the goats on his left. And even though some of them are not, not even born yet, they will repopulate the earth. The goats are already on his left. That includes all the generations that have not even come about, that they're going to come from the seed of the goats. When he separates the righteous from the wicked, when the reapers come, when the reapers come at the trumpet, when the reapers come to gather the righteous and put them into the barn, when the reapers come to grab the tares and throw them into the burning fire at the seventh trumpet, all of mankind will be split into two groups. When we read Matthew 25 about this division, we think that's going to happen like the fire melting with fervent heat. We think that that happens you know, at the very beginning, the initiating stage, well, it actually does. It's really interesting about this last day and about how the judgment actually works. There is a seventh trumpet that blows where there is no reversing the decision that's made by God to separate the peoples. However, the actual finality of the judgment for the wicked is postponed for a thousand years. Give me a seven if you understand that. It's a very interesting maneuver on how God is doing this. And I don't know why he's postponing their judgment. I don't know why he's going to let a thousand years go by where they can still be on the earth, but his righteousness will be over top of them. I don't know why. But when the seventh trumpet blows, the division of the peoples is divided and there's no changing that. The righteous will remain righteous and the wicked will remain wicked, all right? These two groups may still be living on the earth somehow. There still be a holy nation on the earth. There will still be heathen nations on the earth outside the city walls. The whores, the dogs, the whoremongers, and all these peoples will not be included in the kingdom. They'll all be on the earth. So that could also be, uh, you know, a, a way of understanding this. But there will be no one who is lost. No one will have a chance to be saved. And no one who is saved will ever fall away from God or have a chance to fall away from God like we do now. So I'm, I'm talking about this last day, the seventh day, the day of the Lord, judgment day. It seems to be about a time of judgment or, where God is going to judge mankind. And it takes a thousand years to complete it. It takes a split second or the twinkling of an eye to initiate it. That's why I want you to understand the difference between the initiating moment or when it begins to how long it lasts and the idea of when it finally comes to an end. You have to understand these three pieces to the day of the Lord or you're not going to get a good deep understanding about it. Okay. Okay, so the day of the Lord is about an appointed time to judge, and he's going to set up a righteous kingdom on the earth. Acts chapter 17, verse 31, he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. That is the day of the Lord he's talking about right there in Acts 17, 31. He's appointed a day. That is the day of the Lord. 
the day of Christ. On that day, the last day, we must understand that the day of the Lord is both good and bad. The day of the Lord is good and bad. For those who are prepared to see God, it is a wonderful day. We're looking forward to this day. 1 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of, God, of Christ, that each one may receive what is due to him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Um, we could take a moment to talk about this because there's a lot of people who are looking forward to this day who are not really ready. And that would include people who are going to be cast out and into hell and even Christians who may be saved, but they're not as ready as they think they are. Can I get an amen? If you understand that, look, just because you're saved don't mean you're ready for the judgment. Yeah, let that wrap around your head for a minute. People don't understand. People don't understand. The very next verse, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 5, 11, it says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Uh, this is not a day that could be, just because you're saved, is necessarily going to be an easy breezy day. Okay, so let, you, better, you better do some more study about that. Now, this is the day of the Lord. Now, Paul, Paul talks about it and Peter talks about it. Peter talks about it that it's a day that we hasten, that we're, we can't wait for it to get here. It's a day where we, want, we would like to hurry it up and, you know, we don't want it to postpone. I mean, I, I would love to see a world where there's no more rape, murder, and killing, and greed, and all these evil things in the world, and disease, and cancers, poverty, sickness. I, I, I would love and hurry that up, but am I really ready to stand before Christ right now? When I haven't been fully perfected yet, and I've got some issues that I need to get straightened out? See, people think that salvation means that you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. That's not the case. Man, oh man, that's denominational thinking. That's man's understanding. That's man's understanding. You better get with the biblical program, okay? That day of judgment is an intense judgment, even for the elect of God who are saved. So wrap your head around that for a minute. All right, did you notice that? Good or bad, whether good or bad, for the righteous. You're going to give an account for the bad also. Now, that's not your sin before Christ. Don't, let, don't be confused about that. People need to understand that this is not about going to hell or not. And that's why people go, well, as long as I'm saved, it's okay. That's, that's immaturity and that's foolishness. That's complete lack of understanding when you think that way. Okay, this is not about going to, uh, going to heaven or hell. These are people going to heaven, but it is about the consequences of some bad that you've done. Now, I, this is not the same kind of sin that will send you to hell and people don't understand that. The Bible says there is a sin unto death and a sin not unto death. Apparently, these could potentially be sins not unto death. These are sins that are not gonna condemn you to hell. Can I get an amen if you understand that? If you want a scripture to validate that, it's 1 John 5 16. First, first John 5 16 17 somewhere in that area talks about a sin not unto death this is not a bible study about this judgment not so much so but it's okay to get into this a little bit because you need to understand these concepts you need to get away from your denominational teaching and get into the scriptures put all the bible pieces together and get a deeper richer understanding of this judgment for the saints of god Okay, so whether good or bad, there's sins not unto death. And that may be what's going on here. Okay, it's very important to realize that. Whether good or bad. Okay, let's continue. We should be looking forward to the day. Look what it says right here. Remember, although we're, we must give an account unto God, the righteous are not appointed to wrath. And that means eternal wrath. The word wrath is used when God's chast chastising people too. I know that that's almost contradictory to what the Bible's saying. It's not really contradictory. Paul says we're not appointed to wrath. That's talking about eternal, permanent, everlasting wrath. We're not appointed to that condemnation. But that doesn't mean God doesn't get fired up at you sometimes. Okay, which is also the word wrath is used sometimes in certain scriptures. Okay, so we're not appointed to eternal wrath and eternal condemnation, okay? But we may experience 
some heated moments with the chastening of the Lord, okay? We're still going to have to give an account to him when we stand before him, okay? Now, you, you might say to yourself, listen, I don't want to be afraid. Well, if you don't want to be afraid, then repent. If you're not repenting from your sins and you're not afraid, you know what that makes you? A blind and ignorant fool. Foolish. To be living in your sins and not afraid of God. Dumb. Stupid. And I'm not pointing the finger at any individuals because I have acted that way. But if you are living in your sins and you're not terrified, you're being very foolish. Okay. Now you can have that, that fear removed. You don't have to live in that kind of torment because that fear brings torment. The Bible says love cast out fear. And if we're obeying God, if we love God, if we keep his word, and this is another Bible study we're not going to get too deep into, but you don't have to live in terror of the Lord like that because love will cast that fear out, but only if you're obedient. I mean, if you're not obedient, I, there's people right now who are not obe obeying the gospel, who are not obeying the teachings of Jesus, who walk around like they ain't got nothing to worry about. Dumb, very foolish. Okay, but you don't have to live in fear and terror. If you're loving God, love casts out if you're obedient to Jesus. The only way to be in his love is to be obedient. All right, so let's continue here. Okay, the three stages. The day of the Lord. Initiation stage. The duration stage. And the completion stage. At the seventh trumpet, we will see the end of grace. Revelation 10, 7, and other scriptures talk about this. A day of the Lord's a thousand years. We got that scripture already. At the end of the millennial kingdom, we see the final judgment. At the end, how long does it last? Okay, we're talking about when does it complete? When does the day of the Lord begin? At the seventh trumpet, we believe. How long is the day of the Lord? A thousand years, the duration. And then this last thing, when does the day of the Lord end? It ends at the end of that last day. A thousand years comes to an end, right? And then we have the final judgment because that day's a judgment day. You got to have the judgment of the wicked in the day of judgment, which is a thousand year day. The thousand year day is a day of judgment. The righteous are judged at the beginning. The wicked are judged at the end. So when that day comes to an end, we get the final judgment within that day time period. And then the wicked are judged at the great white throne judgment. When? At the last day. When? Judgment day. When is that? The day of the Lord. When? How long is that? That's a thousand year day. Now, let's talk about this scripture right here again. 2 Peter 3, 12. Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of the Lord with the heavens being on fire. Are the heavens going to be on fire for a thousand years? No, I don't think that's what this is talking about. But will they be on fire during the day of the Lord? Yeah, at some point they're going to be. Pinpointing that exact moment looks more like reasonably and rationally that it's going to be at the end when the final judgment of the wicked takes place. Satan comes out, makes war against God again, and all the peoples of the earth are burned up with fire, called down from heaven. We'll look at that in a minute. So on the day of the Lord, the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now we get this idea here that the day of the Lord is one split second long and that's all there is to it, right? And that's where some of these dispensationalists and those who don't understand the <clears throat> literal meaning of a thousand years, <clears throat> you see them all the time on their videos, claiming that, you know, Christ comes back at the seventh trumpet, that's the day of the Lord, all the elements melt, and then the thousand year period is this new heaven and new earth. That's not what's going on. No, he hasn't, he hasn't wiped away sin yet. You can't have the, the day of the Lord complete, the judgment of the wicked complete at the seventh trumpet at that split second, because the Bible tells us for a thousand years, there's going to be lost, sinful nations on the earth. And it does not make any sense that the elements have already melted and the sky is renewed and regenerated with fervent heat, and yet God's going to let sin back in the world? No. When that fire melts the elements and the sky and the stars fall and all that business, when we see God regenerating the earth with fire burning up everything, that's going to include sin. And there will be no more sin on the earth. So we, pick, we put that moment, we put that moment towards the end of the thousand year period, what makes more sense that it's going to correlate to the last judgment because that's when all the sinners are eventually going to be cast into hell. Death, 
and hell and sin and all the nations that are condemned, all the goats on the left hand will finally be, including Satan and all the angels, will finally be removed, plucked out of the earth, the Bible talks about. When the Bible talks about removing the wicked, when the Bible talks about the meek inheriting the earth, that's not going to be final or complete until the end of the millennial kingdom reign or the last day. On that last day period, God's going to allow the wicked to mingle on the earth. And if the righteous are on the earth and not only reserved in the kingdom, uh, in the city Jerusalem, and if they're allowed to come back into the earth, then there's going to be a mixture of righteous and wicked in the earth. I, had, I don't have that all figured out yet, but I, I don't, I'm partial to believing that's possible, okay? But when we talk about lightning, look at this verse right here, Matthew 24, verse 27. For as lightning comes out of the east and shines even unto the west, so shall the coming of Son of Man be. And a lot of people take that one verse and how it's presenting this split second, twinkling of an eye moment, and that's what it is. It, it is that's the initiating stage, the beginning stage of the day of the Lord. They take that to be the end of the day of the Lord. And it's not the end of the day of the Lord. Although you might find scriptures and rhetoric that say he's going to melt the elements during this time, which he will do. But you have to separate the time period. You have to understand with discernment and reasoning and all the other scriptures which call this day a thousand year period. All, and we see in scriptures there's a thousand years that goes by with the nations on the earth. You add all that to this twinkling of an eye moment and then you get a better picture. You can't just take these twinkling of an eye scriptures and, and, and get stuck and imbalanced in your understanding of what the day of the Lord is because you got a few scriptures that seem to indicate that it's just this blink of an eye moment. But there's a whole bunch of other scriptures that give us a longer time period for this day. Okay, so 2 Thessalonians 2.8 says the same thing. Let's look at this. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy, look, with the brightness of his coming, Satan's going to be destroyed, right? But we see in scripture that he's not destroyed at the beginning. When the brightness comes, he's put into a bottomless pit, isn't he? How long is Satan put into the bottomless pit? For a thousand years. So why does the scripture talk about shall destroy him with the brightness of his coming? Like it's a twinkling of an eye, like lightning comes from the east to the west. Because both are true. When Christ comes back in the twinkling of an eye, that's going to be the initiating moment of the day of the Lord. There is no hope for Satan. He's put in a pit. He's going to be judged at the end. And even though it takes a thousand years and even though it's prolonged and, and uh, you know, delayed for a moment, it's really the judgment has been put down. It's, it is still consecrated. It's not, you know, finalized, but... In a, it, technically and actually, you've got these different things, this different way of looking at it. Technically, it's not finalized yet, but actually it is. Actually, it, it's over. When Christ comes back on the horse in Revelation 19, he's got a sword coming out of his mouth. That's where we see Matthew 24, 27. As lightning comes from the, from the east to the west. Can you guys visualize that with me? At the beginning of the thousand years. Can you guys, can you guys understand that? Give me a seven if you understand how some of these scriptures sound like it's in the twinkling of an eye. How some of these scriptures sound like with the brightness of his coming, it's over. Like when you read these scriptures, the elements melt instantly. When Christ appears, it's all you know, melted and it's done. When you, we get this. But it's the initiating moment. You have to understand the difference between the initiating moment of the day of the Lord and the final product and end result of the day of the Lord and how long it lasts. Okay. So 2 Peter talks about the melting of the elements and we get the brightness of his coming and we get the uh, lightning comes and we get this concept. So that's what I want you to understand. These, when you read scriptures like this, that's the initiating moment of the day of the Lord. Okay, let's continue. When does the day of the Lord end? When do we see fire come down from heaven? Look at Revelation 20 verse 9. Look what Revelation 20 verse 9 says about fire coming down from the Lord. We get scriptures to tell us when this happens. When does it happen? Well, let's read it. Revelation 20, verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints 
and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. If you read Revelation 20, the whole chapter, this verse is at the end of the thousand year period. This is where we see fire coming down to devour everyone. There is a difference between the initiating day of the Lord and the end of the day of the Lord. When God initiates the day of the Lord, he does not kill all the wicked. At the end of the day of the Lord, all of the wicked are finally killed. You guys with me out there, do you understand? There's a difference between the beginning and the end of the day of the Lord. The wicked will not be completely devoured or killed at the beginning. They will be devoured and killed by fire and judged at the great white throne judgment. Every man, woman, and child, angels included at the end of the thousand year period. So now you understand this right here. Now you understand the day of the Lord and the stages of the Lord better. Now you understand the concept a lot better. I think once you got this concept down though, Every time you read something about the day of the Lord, you're going to really, it's going to sink in. You're going to really understand it. Even though if it sounds like it's an instantaneous scripture, that's like, you know, right there, you're going to know where to put it. When you understand the depth of the day of the Lord and the three stages of the day of the Lord, you know where the scripture is going to fall into play. Now you understand how the wicked can be on the earth for a thousand years and it still be the day of the Lord. Now you understand that the elements are stick, are, they're going to melt everything. Yeah, that's going to come and you understand where that's at in the day of the Lord. When you understand how long the day of the Lord is, the, everything makes sense. Everything's scriptural. Everything is absolutely written down this way. This is the way it's supposed to be understood. This is the better understanding, guys. So give God grace. Give God glory for the grace. And let me just say, Everything that we're learning, we're learning together as a group, is, is by the grace of God. And I, I don't know anything, and I am not a teacher, and I'm not wise, and it's only from the, the revelation of God and the wisdom of God, and I get things wrong all the time. And I'm watching videos, I'm like, why did I say that? And I learned something different, and I, and I was wrong. And you need to understand these on your own. You need to read the Bible yourself, fast and pray. Read all the scriptures yourself and make sure that you know it because you read it, not because you heard me say it. Because I am nothing without Jesus. He's the one giving us wisdom and teaching us, okay?